Hey, good morning, everybody. So glad you guys are here. Thanks for being here this morning. Hey, if you're joining us online, I'm, I'm glad you're here as well. A special, a special greeting to our, our fathers who are, who are with us this morning, who are watching online this morning. Uh, being, being a father is an incredible responsibility, right? It's, it's a privilege. It's, it's an honor. And one, regardless of what culture says, it's one of the most important things a man can do is to be a father. And now when I say father, uh, I mean more than simply donating some DNA, right? I, 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 mean, I mean the, the guy who gets up at night when the kids are sick. I, I mean the man who, who is changing diapers, not just the easy diapers, the up the back, all over the place diapers, that, that kind that kind of diapers. He's up when the kids are, are sick, showing up to kids' games rather than playing in their own games. The man who chooses to be present rather than, than vying for that next position up the proverbial ladder. The man who does what he says. And one of the things he says most of all is, is I'm sorry. The man who knows who he is, who is who, who's, a, who's broken, and he knows that he's broken, who needs a Savior, and he knows that he needs a Savior. He knows that he is a child of the Most High God, and he leads his family to know that God by getting out in front, by, by taking a bullet, by sacrificing for his family, by serving. I'm talking about a man who gives, a man who loves well, a man who tells the story of God's grace. Today, we lift up those dads. We lift up all of you who are fathers, and we just want to praise God for you. And so I want to start this morning by praying, uh, and then we'll jump into our, our topic for the day. So if you would, please join me in prayer. If you're joining us online, please, please join me in, in praying. Gracious God, uh, you are our heavenly Father. And Lord, we praise you. We give thanks for you. We need you. Lord, this morning, as, as uh, across our country, we celebrate dads. God, we ask that, that, that you would bless them, that you would, that you would hold them, that you would speak into their lives, that you, would, that you would take the scales off their eyes, that they might see who you are, and in that, see who they are, God, and, and be comforted in that. God, strengthen Strengthen our men. Let them know that they are loved, that they are valued, that they have a real purpose, God, in this world, in their families. Lord, we ask that you would join us in our time today as we open up your word and look at what you have to teach us. God, we need, we need you to be here. We're thankful that you are here. Make us aware of your presence, God, and change us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, so we're going um, to continue in our series called Blind Spots. And remember what we're talking about when we talk about blind spots. It's, it's the idea that, that there are things that we can't see. And, and today we're, we're going to go big with that because because most of us are blind to our, to our current reality, to, to the world that we live in, to the experience uh, all around us. And there's a remedy to that. So if you have your Bibles, open up with me to the Gospel of John. So, so every time we come together, I'm going to ask you guys to, to open up your Bible. I want you guys to become students of Scripture. Man, this is, this is how we lead. We lead by example, right? And so, so we, we know our Bibles. We know them well. And, and don't get intimidated by that. Start where you are. Open up with me to the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter. We've been hanging out here for the past couple of weeks. And now, now not everybody has been with us for the past couple of weeks, so let me bring you up to speed as, as to where we've been. As you read through the chapter, the, it, it begins with Jesus noticing, he's walking with his disciples, he notices this beggar who has been blind since birth. And he gives sight. He heals this guy, physically heals his eyes. He hasn't seen anything his entire life, but after his encounter with Jesus, he can see. 
We took notice that first week that, that Jesus took notice. He, he saw someone that most of the world just kind of throws to the side, but not in God's kingdom, because in God's kingdom, everyone matters. Everyone matters. Everyone. Blind men and women of every tribe, every ethnicity matter to our God. Healthy boys and girls matter to our God. We touched on this, hear this, right? Unborn boys and girls matter in the kingdom of God. Aging men and women matter in the kingdom of God. Everyone matters in the kingdom of God. And that is really good news. You matter. You matter. In that moment, there was a physical miracle that took place when, when Jesus interacted with this man. And people took notice of what happened. They noticed in part because Jesus intentionally healed the beggar on what we call the Sabbath, this, this holy day, this day set apart for, for rest, for our rest, that we might be healed, that we might be built up. But there's this group of people who are religious leaders called the Pharisees, and they didn't they didn't think that was right because what Jesus did is he, he, he grabbed some dirt and he spat in the dirt. He took ordinary stuff and he did a miracle with it. But he, he worked. He did some physical work. And they said, you don't, you don't do that on Sabbath. You broke Sabbath law. And so this conflict continued to stir. That's what Jesus, Jesus kind of does. He, he kind of walks into this world and he, he, he sees buttons that need to be pushed, change that needs to be made, and he stepped into this system and he stirred the pot and the pot, the proverbial pot, started to boil over. There's a conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. And so as this conflict progresses, it becomes plain that the characters in this story, the blind beggar, he's, he's beginning to see reality more and more clearly all the time. And his clarity leads him to worship. That's what happens. We get clear on Jesus, who he is. We, we worship him. And that's where we find the beggar. That's, that's the outcome. But the Pharisees, on the other hand, these, these religious leaders, their, their clarity on reality becomes less and less. Their, their hearts and their minds be, begin, to, begin to harden. And they, they become more blind to Jesus and his kingdom. Now, as, as we read through the story, we, we see that this beggar, as he's becoming more and more clear, first he sees Jesus as a man, then he sees Jesus as a prophet. He's getting more clear. And then, then, he, then he risks his life as he kind of goes toe-to-toe with the religious leaders. And at the very end, clarity is, 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 is crystal, right? And he, he worships Jesus. But the Pharisees move the opposite direction. Verse 16 we read that this man, Jesus, is not from God. That's their declaration. Verse 22, if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he's to be put out of the synagogue. Now now Jesus is an enemy of God. And then finally, verse 24, this man, this Jesus, he's a sinner, not, not a Messiah. And what becomes plain is, as we come to the last three verses of the story, is that what be, began as a, as a miracle, of, of a physical miracle of miracle of gaining sight has become, as so often happens in the gospel, a picture of of spiritual healing, a deeper healing, because there is a deeper life. All right, so, so now we find ourselves at the very end, verses 39 through 41. Follow along with me as, as I read this. I'm reading from the New English Translation. We read, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that those who do not see may gain their sight, and the ones who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this, and they asked him, We are not blind too, are we? And Jesus replied, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now, because you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. There's a a whole lot here, so let's, let's kind of unpack this together. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world. 
so that those who do not see may gain their sight, and the ones who see may become blind. For judgment I've come into the world. Okay, you read this, and if you're like me, I, I, so, so uh, I, I've, I've, read, I've read a lot of scripture, right? And I, and I read that, I go, hey, that, that, that seems to contradict some, some other things that I've heard about Jesus, some other things that Jesus has said about himself. Like there's no condemnation in, in Christ. Let me, just, let me just take you to two places, right? In two other places, Jesus emphatically said that he didn't come to judge the world. So there's, there's a contradiction here, right? John 3, 17, he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Right? We see in John 12, 47, For I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And so what gives here? See, what seems to be a contradiction when you look a little bit deeper, it, it works itself out. Je- Jesus' point in John 9, 39 is, is not that his ultimate purpose, I mean the reason that he came was condemnation. He, he came to save, not to condemn. So when he says, for judgment I came into the world, what he means is that inevitably, as, as Jesus comes to, to save, right? That's what he's here to do, to save, to save by truth, to save by love, to save by righteousness. If he's going to save, again, he's got to save somebody from something, so something is wrong, so he's making a judgment statement that I, I need to take you from something into, into something else. And so he makes a judgment on that something. There has to be an acknowledgement of, of brokenness, uh, uh, of sin, and a judgment is made on that. And a response is required by the one being judged. It's kind of like, like a firefighter who runs into a burning house and he finds a trapped victim there. And he says to the victim, hey, hey, fire's not good, right? We need, we need to go. He's making a judgment in that instance, right? Let's get out of the fire, right? And that, and that victim has to, has to respond to that. Do I want to stay in the fire or... Or not? Do I want saving or not? It, it's like a doctor being called in to amputate a man's arm that's, that's horribly infected. It's, it's life-threatening. And just, just before that, that man goes under the anesthesia, he asks the doctor, well, did, did you come here to cut off my arm? And he says, no, I didn't come here to cut off your arm. I came here to save your life. The mission of Jesus was not condemnation, but it's It's transformation. It's transformation. Jesus' mission, unequivocally, is is to save. Right? And so so the the second half of verse 39, Jesus explains how he has come for this this judgment that saves. He's come for judgment that those who do not see may gain their sight. This is really good news. And the ones who see may become blind. That's not such good news. See, on the, on the one hand, this, this judging of Jesus, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut away the, the blinding calluses of our hearts and, 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 and provide protection uh, 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 against the blinding brilliance of, of God's glory. See, on the, on the other hand, brilliance of God's glory has this, this blinding effect on those who claim to see. Like, 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 like I can see on my own. I, I don't need any, any help. I, could, I can already do this. I don't need your protection, Jesus. And verse 39 says, says this, that, that those who see, that those who make that claim, they will become blind because the brilliance of God's glory is it, it, it's like a searing fire. Jesus speaks to the Pharisees in verse 40. He says some of the Pharisees, we read that some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this. And they asked him, well, we're not blind too, are we? Now, now, Jesus, in my mind, I mean, he, he could have gone a different direction with this, right? He could have said, really? Really, this is where you guys want to go with this, Pharisees? 
I mean, I gave you guys one job. I mean, really, it was, it was, it was relatively simple. You just, you just help people find God. You help people answer their questions about God. And these, these guys come to you, right? These, these neighbors of this blind beggar, they, they come to you, but the blind beggar's not blind anymore. He can now see, right? He's, he's healed. And you, you guys, you're supposed to be the ones who, who, who know what that means, who know what healing blind people means, because that's something that only God does. Remember, God told Moses, who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? The psalmist cried out. He said, the Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lives up those who are bound down. I mean, there's, there's no story in our scriptures where, where blind people are healed. But yet Isaiah keeps talking about it as being one of the signs and the blessings of the coming messianic age. We read in Isaiah, right? Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. We read, I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Seriously, people. This man can see. Did you ever, did you ever think that maybe, just maybe, there was some significance for you as experts in Scripture, that maybe you would know what's happening. Now, Jesus could have said that, but he didn't say that. I mean, that's, that's basically what the blind beggar said, right? Remember, he said, man, this, this is an amazing thing. You, you say you don't know where he comes from, this Jesus, but he opened my eyes. I know where he came from. He obviously came from God. Yes, God speaks to Moses, but God actually listens to this guy. But Jesus didn't even say a simple, yes, you're, you're blind. Yeah, you, you are blind. Instead, he gives an answer that sheds light on the question about sin that the disciples started with. You remember way back at the beginning of this whole story, the question is, why is this guy blind? What sin did he commit? What sin did his parents commit? Jesus replied, if, if you're blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now, because you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. The whole story started with Jesus saying, look, look, don't blame this guy or his parents for his blindness. It's not his fault. And now he's saying the same thing. Blindness itself isn't what's wrong here. The blindness isn't the sin. It's the result of our sin, right? But, but, it, but if you're blind and you go around telling people that you can see, that's the problem. That's where you're going wrong, Pharisees. That's where you're going wrong. I mean, the truth is you don't see. The truth is you are blind. Which means that there is, there is this, this kind of blindness, a, a spiritual blindness rooted in, in willful rebellion against the light of God. See, we're blind because we embrace the blindness. We're, we're, blind, we're blind because we love darkness. We're blind because we don't want to see light. Or, gui or be guided out of our darkness or have to confess that, that the work that we have been doing is really just self-indulgent work. It's trying to puff me up. When, when you're blind but you, you claim to see, you look like a fool. And it's, it's not just that you look like a fool, you actually close yourself off from being helped. Our, our help comes from the Lord, right? But, but when we embrace the darkness, we, we push away that help. When we say, when we make the claim, no, 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 I can see. I can see it all. I don't, I don't need any help. We, we, we cut ourselves off from the only help that will do any good. And not only that, we, we, we hurt others around us, especially fathers. Hear this especially as we try to lead our families. But when we lead from a position of pride, like I have this whole thing figured out, and I don't need any help, and I don't need this Jesus, we lead our whole family down that path. 
a path of darkness, a path of death. When, when the light comes to someone who doesn't want to see, it's, it's a blinding light instead of an illuminating light. And the Pharisees in this story, they're, they're, they're forcing their eyes shut, not wanting to see the Son of Man who's speaking to them. The guilt isn't in being blind. We're guilty because we don't think we need to be healed from our blindness. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that those who do not see may gain their sight and the ones who see may become blind. See, there, there's, there's a fork in the road, right? We're all on this journey together and, and, and Jesus just lays it out. There, there is a fork. There are two different paths that we can go down. There's a, there's a choice that we make. When Jesus says he came that the ones who see may become blind, I, I think he means that that those who have perfectly good eyes in their, in their heads, the ability to process, to think, to reason, who can see evidences, who can, who can hear sermons and, 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 and read blogs and, and read scripture and get acquainted with Jesus, but who will not admit that they are blind and that they need to be born again and, and receive this spiritual light so that they might see that they actually become blind. They choose that path. Their blindness is made evident. And they resist the healing action of Jesus instead succumbing to blindness that can never be reversed. Simply because we deny the one who can give us sight. The only one. But Jesus is saying there's, there's, that's not the only path. And that's not the preferred path. Actually, uh, there, is, there is another way. The way. Jesus. You can choose this other path. You can embrace your blindness, embrace your brokenness, and understand who you are, that apart from Jesus, that you are spiritually blind, and allow the light of the world to come in and give you sight. That's the story. So fathers, I, I, want, you, I want you to think on that. I mean, this is where we start being a father is, is when, when we, we recognize who we are, we recognize our own brokenness, and instead of, instead of coming from this position of pride, and, and I have this all figured out, and I'm the guy, it's, you know what, I don't have this all figured out, but I know one who does. And so let's follow him together. Let me, let me take a step in front of you, and then you just, you just step behind me. And let's allow Jesus to give us sight as we walk through this life. This is what it looks like to be a dad. Be a father. A man who knows his own brokenness. I, I, I want to close with this thought. You know, this, this whole story, it, it brings up a, a question that, that, that I, I, think, I think you're asking. And, and the question is this, why, why does God choose to heal this blind man? I mean, wh- why, why, why does he choose to heal this man and not every other blind person? I mean, he healed this blind beggar, but how many other blind beggars were there that he didn't heal? Which, which now we, we make it personal and we say, well, yeah, why, why doesn't he heal me? Why doesn't he change me? Why doesn't he, he change my spouse, heal my spouse? Why, why, doesn't he, why doesn't he show up when I need him? show up? Why didn't he heal my child? You know, this story suggests that there are times when God doesn't come through. The scripture tells us, and experience bears out, that, that God always keeps his promises. I, I want you to understand that at the heart of the story, the blind man is healed of his blindness, not because God loves him more, not because he is unusually special, not because God heard his prayer above every other prayer. Actually, there's no mention of prayer in this whole story. The blind man is healed for a reason beyond his personal benefit. He's healed, Scripture tells us, through the lips of Jesus, to accomplish the purposes of God. 
and his purpose in this moment, right? He was selected to be healed of his physical blindness so that it might signal Jesus' ability, Jesus' desire to heal our, our greater and our more long-lasting problem as a people, our own spiritual brokenness, our own spiritual blindness. See, the real healing that we need, the healing that we long for, that is available to everyone who asks, is this healing of spiritual blindness. I mean, just think with me on this. Healing from physical blindness is like putting a Band-Aid on a chainsaw wound. I mean, it helps for a second, for a moment. Our, our, our temporal problem is a, is a physical problem, but our eternal problem is a spiritual brokenness, a spiritual blindness. And, and here's the great hope. If, if that spiritual blindness is remedied, it will automatically remedy physical blindness in due time. That's the promise, right? When we meet Jesus... We'll, we'll be given a new body. We will all be able to see. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more crying. No more death. Jesus came to solve the bigger of the two problems that we experience. And when we receive his solution for the bigger problem, all the other problems are remedied as well. I mean, God, this is how, how this works, right? God may choose to heal you in this life in a physical way. But it doesn't mean that he loves you any more or any less. God may choose not to extend your life, not to heal your physical illness. And that doesn't, that doesn't speak of his love for you or, or, or not loving you. See, I'm, I'm here to tell you that a relationship with him is what we're really after. That's the healing that we really need. Uh, hear, hear this. And, and fathers, I, I want you to hear this clearly. Men, you, you are dying. I, I'm, I'm dying right, right now. And with, with every tick of the clock, I come closer to that day that I will meet Jesus. And it's the same for you. Nothing is going to change that. It's the way things are in this world because sin entered our world and has made a mess of our world. And we're responsible for that. And so, so, so the question, the question really is, how, how many times does God have to heal us before we say that He's good? That He's a good God, that He's a, he's a good Father. Because if he heals us of our illness today, the reality is we're only going to get ill some other time into the future and eventually our bodies will stop. And it doesn't, doesn't mean we don't want to be healed today. That's, that's not what I'm saying. It's not that we want, don't want to embrace this life. This, this is a good life. But it ends in death. So, so how many times does he have to, to heal us of our, of our physical ailments until we say, okay, God, now you're good. Now, now you're good. And the answer to that question really is, it's, it's just one time. It's one time. He only has to heal us once because there is this one healing that's essential. And he offers that one healing to all of us. The reality is that anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus for spiritual healing from their spiritual blindness, from their brokenness, will in every single circumstances, yours included, you will be healed. And when you experience that kind of spiritual healing, you will experience eternity. And when you experience eternity, that means every single physical ailment that you have is taken care of. And we know in the meantime that we experience serious sorrow. Some of you are experiencing that today. Some of you have, have walked through that value, valley and it will, it, will, it will come again. But there is a critical difference between that experience for a person who knows the love of Jesus and for the person who doesn't know the love of Jesus. There is a strength and a comfort that comes in that spiritual healing when, when we see and we experience the love of our Father and He cradles us, He holds us as we walk through this life. He is there with us in that moment. How many times does God have to heal you before you can say, He is good? 
It's just once. It's just once. And so today, here, here, here's the bottom line of all of this. Today, embrace your blindness. Embrace your brokenness. Understand your, your, your current position. And then allow the light of the world, Jesus, to heal you and to give you spiritual sight. Let's pray together.